Hello everyone, CJ here. In this video, I want to present to you all some tips on how to exponentially grow the size of your gaming kingdom and be the hero kings or queens you're meant to be. Or I mean, grow the size of your Dungeons & Dragons community using conventions. And to do that, I am joined by Merrick Blackman, the organizer of the Dungeons & Dragons play area of PAX Australia. Um, hi, I'm Merrick. I've been uh, playing Dungeons & Dragons for uh, about 30 years now. Um, in the last 10 years or so, I started running games at my local store, uh, which has built up to be you know, quite, a, quite a number of tables running. And um, five years back, I started running um, the Dungeons & Dragons at various conventions around um, Australia. But before I continue, I would like to tell you that Beadle & Grimm has partnered with this channel to offer $25 discount to their Platinum Edition of Waterdeep Dragon Heist gear. You can find the list of all the included items and shipping destinations in the description section below. What's a better way for players to show their appreciation to their DM and also upgrade their own play experience, eh? Think of it as an early present to yourself for the holiday season. In recent years, Dungeons & Dragons have exploded in popularity. There are very highly visible online groups like Critical Role, podcasts like The Adventure Zone, and even various YouTube channels dedicated to it. But sometimes, the pool of actual players around you can feel a lot smaller. This is especially true if you live in a very small town in United States or in a country where tabletop RPGs are virtually unknown. Even as a tabletop RPG YouTuber, I feel that what most people like me are doing is mostly raising awareness and entertaining people. We usually reach an audience who already have DND in their search or viewing history. In my personal observation, what really gets people to start playing instead of just wishing to play, is actually trying out the game for themselves. And conventions, especially geeky ones like PAX, are a great place to find new players. There's really two types of D&D convention. You have the one which is um, a dedicated role-playing convention, where everyone there is coming just to play role-playing games. And that's um, those sorts of conventions get people who come to experience a wide range of role-playing games, including D&D &D and other things. And then you have the more general conventions like PAX, and they're um, where people get to encounter role-playing for the very first time. And so PAX is, and other general conventions are fantastic for introducing people to, hey, this is a role-playing game, this is how you play it, and going from there. And we've had a lot of people who have come here played it for the first time and in future years I've, um, they've come back and said we're playing all the time now we did that because we first played it with you at PAX. Which one is easier joining an established convention like PAX or running your own smaller dedicated convention? When um, I became the Adventure League local coordinator for Victoria um, one of the things which was there was go to a major convention okay what conventions did we have here there was PAX and so I said hey I'm going to run some D&D at PAX and PAX was interesting because um, I didn't have to do a lot of work on getting the convention running. I just have to worry about the Dungeons and Dragons side. So if you have a convention which is already running, go, um, gathering and organising a bunch of Dungeon Masters and whatever to play a lot easier. If you're starting from scratch and you don't have a convention at all, that's trickier. You sort of start small. Um, Part of it is um, I've got the experience of running it from the local store, and that just in itself is huge experience in organising a game. Um, you, if you've got more than one table running, you're learning about um, getting players together and getting DMs together, and that's really important. Um, and communicating with them, because if they don't know what's going on, then they don't come. Of course, if your tabletop group is pretty small, and you don't think you have enough credentials, you can build up your reputation by grinding a bit and level up by running smaller events in shops, tabletop cafes, or school or university clubs, and document your events with photos. You can join smaller conventions too, of course, but it doesn't hurt to ask in the first place. They may already have interested parties wanting to do the same, and they might want to collaborate with you. Okay, now, let's say that you are able to secure some space at a convention. Now let's ask the next question. What should you prepare for it? It depends on which, and again, what, which type of convention you're running. But um, you want um, to have the Dungeon Masters, to work out a schedule of the Dungeon Masters so that um, 
um, they're all available and you can always run games. Um, you want to have advertising so that the players know that it's going on. And I use Facebook a lot for that, to say, hey, we're running things, um, please come along. Twitter as well, um, there are other, and whatever social media works for you. Um, you also got to source adventures. Um, I use the Adventure League adventures because, um, partly because it's a global campaign. Everyone gets familiar with it. It's very easy to join in. Uh, so some people will run their own adventures, some will get them written specially. That works as well, but it's a bit more organisation to do it that way. You will generally have a good idea of what the maximum number is of how many tables you can run because you're limited by the space or the number of Dungeon Masters you have. Um, the adventures, again, this is, a, this is a tricky one. It's one of scheduling and it changes from whether you're doing it as this is an introduction to Dungeons and Dragons or this is something for experienced players to play with. Um, if you're playing with new players, you don't need as many scenarios. You're um, saying, here's the introduction. You could do it with just one. Um, and then you get a lot of different people coming in and playing the game once. Um, at PAX, we've got a sort of a hybrid thing. We have a lot of players playing it for the first time, and about the other half of the players are playing it again. And we give three or four other scenarios so that they can play. Whenever you run a convention, someone is going to pull out or fall ill. And it's happened to me a number of times when I've been running PAX. And um, there's two options which you have. One is you beg for one of the, your DMs who is um, not busy at that particular time to go and help you, and that's what I've done in some years. Um, and the other one is to actually say, hey, I've got um, uh, um, eight slots, but I'll um, have nine DMs scheduled for that, just in case one falls over. And when you've got a convention like PAX, where you've got people walking up on the day rather than pre-registering, that ninth person is very useful in case you, oh, let's run an extra table, or let's help someone sign up. And both those roles are really useful. To add to what Medic had said, sometimes it is not enough to just assume that a convention will prepare everything else that you need. You should ask them even for the most redundant things like tables, actual tables instead of table space. Will they provide them? The chairs, electricity if you need it, even the internet or Wi-Fi. Prepare as if you're running a convention from scratch. Ask them what they can officially provide you in writing. Even then, come up with contingencies in case they are unable to fulfill that part of the deal. Like bringing some foldable table in the trunk of your car or something like that. In fact, there are many disasters that can happen and will most likely happen at a convention. There are a lot of disasters that can happen, apart from the fact of, um, oh, everyone didn't turn up. And that, that, that's, that's really the worst thing that can happen. You, you've um, prepared a lot and no one turns up. How do you get around that? Don't know. <laughs> but, um, but assuming that you do get people turning up, we um, probably the worst thing that can happen is there is a mismatch between what they expect to be playing and what you're actually playing. And that's really a matter of communication, um, of um, explaining beforehand what's the sort of game you're running. If you're running an Adventurers League game, you're running a game which has got a very um, strong storyline um, and is relatively linear in playing. And some people, especially if they've come out of watching something like Critical Role, will be f um, familiar with a more free-flowing style, which may not be the game you're running. Alternatively, if you've um, got players who are used to a very straightforward linear game and you ask them to go um, um, the sandbox environment where they can go anywhere, they may struggle with that as well. So you have that problem of um, the mismatch between uh, the style of game and what's actually being played. Um, then there are just some certain rules in the Adventurers League or in any game you've got which they may not like. Um, no, you can't play your favourite Baylor Paladin. Even if you have set up a play area in a convention, it can still be intimidating to those who haven't played any tabletop RPGs to sign up to play, especially in such a public area. So here are some tips from Merrick to get people to sign up. Our general um, thing at PAX is to have friendly people on the sign-up table. It makes it a lot easier. Um, when you've got people who are, very, uh, who are very good with people, um, then it's a lot easier to come up and say, hey, I want to play, and they can say, hey, yes, we want you to play. Um, here's a game which will be great for you. Go with that. And so um, we talk a lot about the Dungeon Masters and how important they are to run the games, because without them, you don't get a game. Um, but having people to actually um, organise people actually 
getting to play the game, the people who spruik the game, who sign up people, that's really important as well. PAX is not a pre-registered convention, so everyone just comes up to the sign-up table and plays. And that's very common in a lot of conventions. Um, the other one which you find in the more dedicated role-playing ones is that there's a pre-sign-up um, page. So people going to the convention um, a week or three before they actually get to the convention have chosen which games they're going to play. Now those are not the ones you want to worry about being intimidating because they're not new. They, it's, it's the ones in a convention like PAX and there it is get someone friendly to um, actually say, hey, this is what you can play and um, show them what to play. Additionally, remember that you will often have players with different amount of experience playing the game. Some of the more experienced players may not be patient enough to wait for new players to be explained the rules. And some new players may be too indecisive. So here are some tips from Merrick to help smooth things over. Yeah. There are players, experienced players, who you never want with a new player, and that's just one of the ways it works. So, and as if you're dungeon mastering such a table, we just got to pay attention to that and try and calm down their worst tendencies. Uh, the other side, of course, is the new player who feels completely intimidated by everything. And when you're running the game, you've got to... Um, um, well, it's, it's a couple of things. One is, they may, might be quite happy being quiet. They're having a lot of fun that way, so you recognise that. But also give them opportunities to do things where you actually um, um, turn to them and say, is there anything you want to do? And offer suggestions, if you like, um, of what they can do if they're struggling. Um, I th uh, one of the things which we've, I've been very strong is creating a character sheet for new players, which is very easy for them to read. Um, and very easy to pick up because Dungeons and Dragons, while it's not the most complex game, complex game around, it's still complicated. Um, but if you've got a character sheet that makes it very clear what they can do and gives suggestions for the basic things they'll be doing, it makes it a lot easier. And that's true of any role-playing game. If you're trying to do um, um, a game of um, James Bond, there are, there's a, it's a completely different experience. But if you give some guidelines on the character sheet about or, or as a GM about what sort of activities they'll be going on, it makes it easier for the new player to join in. And then, um, and then you've got the advanced players who are really good teachers, and so you're fine there. So it, it's a small subset of things when you've got an advanced player who um, doesn't like new players and new players who are frightened. But you've got to deal with it. But yeah, you, you try to try the best you can. I know that some of you watching this might be younger. You might be students from universities or high school. So I asked Merrick, what advice can he give to you guys? I've got a feeling that conventions generally have been started by university age students. Um, uh, and one of the reasons, uh, right, th there's two things here. You have conventions which are run at, a, um, um, at some place which is hired. And for those conventions, you need adults to um, do all the hiring and stuff like that. Um, we found it very difficult here in Australia because the insurance of that is quite a lot of money. So um, it is tricky to start off with those ones, but um, they happen. So people um, um, who are, if you're um, um, brave enough and you're um, hopeful enough, you can do it. It's absolutely possible. Um, um, for, uh, uh, however, the other way of doing it is to run game days at local stores. And there's a lot of stores who want, uh, who will be quite happy to have the room and um, get people in to play it with you. So um, um, you talk to them and they um, either you hire the space from them or they're just happy to give you the space and you organize a day and get it all together. Um, having the game days at the store is what I basically started with. I'm, I'm, Eventually, it's sort of a weekly game which I organise 60 people for. Um, so I'm running, a, I'm sort of running a mini convention twice a week, uh, um, uh, and then it, then it's a step up to a another sort of convention. It's a different experience. Um, I don't have much experience. I have absolutely no experience of running a convention from the ground up, actually hiring the halls. I've always found another existing convention and um, just joined in and organised stuff. But it's certainly possible and you can do it. If you are in high school, consider asking your teacher or other adults to help. For my last question, I ask Merrick for other ways to grow your tabletop RPG community. There are so many ways that I haven't even dreamed of. Uh, 
we have seen the last few years the rise of actual play, which is a huge thing. Um, and as a result, we actually have um, um, one of the people, um, Ben Loomers, who runs Sirenscape, is not at PAX. He's been at PAX every other year. He's an Australian who made this really incredible app uh, for playing sounds to enhance a role playing game, and he's not here. Why is he not here? He's at TwitchCon. He's doing a, he's at a convention about streaming and there are um, online conventions, Roll20Con and everything. So those are one, another way of um, promoting the hobby. So you've got the online aspect. Um, um, things will start, things will generally start small. I ran Dungeons and Dragons at the Conquest convention this year. And we, when I start, started on the first day there, we had four players and one table. And then it built up th throughout the convention. So we had about four tables. And I'd budgeted it for three. So, oh, come in, please DM for us. Um, but next year, I expect it will get bigger and then bigger the year after. It's, it's something which doesn't come immediately. Whenever you have a convention, the first one is, tends to be small. Um, the, one of the biggest gaming conventions in the world is Gen Con. It is absolutely huge. It began as a, fr um, a group of friends running games and for some of their friends, a really small group of people. And now, well, I think there was some like a hundred tables of Dungeons and Dragons all running at the same time, plus thousands of other games all running. So you start small, you build up and you learn as you go. Before I end the video, let me be real here dogs. Most of the time, running an event is not a money maker. Often, the organizers and the DMs are paying out of pocket. So this is usually a passion project done to spread the love for the hobby. But it doesn't mean that you can't try to recoup your losses by getting sponsorship from local game shops, cafes, or related businesses. But of course, when money comes into play, you need to handle things a lot more responsibly. And it can be a tinderbox for conflict, especially for less experienced organizers. So watch out for that. You don't want to burn your friendship over money. Anyway, I hope all those advice had been helpful to you, and I wish you all the best of luck growing your gaming community. CJ, over and out.